Hi there. We're in the garden for this video due to the coronavirus uh, restrictions. But I thought that would be a great opportunity to show you all my winter camping gear. Basically, the gear and the clothing I use for a wild camp in the Peak District. Now, I say winter camping gear. It's UK or England's winter, which isn't necessarily mean snow. We only get a little bit snow each year. It's um, Years ago we got loads, but probably due to global warming, we hardly get anything now. It's mostly um, damp, wet and windy. So you think, who would want to go wild camping in weather like that? But once you're out there, you're properly kitted out, you, you forget the weather and you just enjoy the wild camp and the, the challenges it brings. So yeah, a great time to show you all my gear. I'm going to split the video into four sections really. First, first of all, we'll look at the gear I use, um, the, the clothing should I say. Uh, so I'll go through all my clothing. We'll then look at my camping gear. I'm going to put a sheet down, get everything out of my rucksack, and I'll, I'll show you all the, uh, the gear I use from the tent, the sleep system, what I cook with. So we'll go through all the gear. And then I thought, now people don't often show this, I'll show you how I care for my gear after I've been on a wild camp. It's usually soaking wet, probably a bit muddy, so I'll show you how I look after my gear. And then at the end of the video, I'll go through the, the camera gear I use. Um, it, it has changed a bit. I have tried to, to lighten my system, but uh, we'll sit down in the, the summer house uh, and I'll go through the camera gear that I use. Now what I will do, I'm, I'm just going to tell you about the gear, not going to great detail. So I will list it all out in the description of the video. So I will put a list of all the items of kit. I'm not going to say where to buy it from because part of it is shopping around to get the best deal. And a lot of my gear is five or ten years old. So you probably can't get half of this stuff now. So... We'll put this rucksack down and uh, we'll have a look at my clothing first. So we'll have a look at my uh, clothing first. Now one thing that did surprise me while I was sort of listing out all my gear um, some of it I forgot what it was even called. So I was looking on the internet and obviously looking at prices and I was astounded at how much things cost. A lot of my gear I bought five or ten years ago. What I could say, the gear in my rucksack at today's prices would cost about £2,000. The clothing that I've got on, this was getting up to £1,000. So it's not cheap. But you don't have to start out like that. You can buy second hand gear, you can buy cheaper gear, like I did when I started. And then you just update each piece at a time. Occasionally now, for the fun of it, I'll find something that's a bit better and uh, buy a bit of new gear. We all like buying gear. But yeah, it was, I, I was astounded. Uh, basically the main one, I'll tell you, the Sulu 10. Well, I couldn't believe the price on that. Anyway, we'll look at, uh, look at my gear, what I'd, what I'd go out in. So starting from the, probably inside, underneath here, 
I've got a merino wool um, thermal, so I've got a top and bottom, that's a merino wool, so it's very warm. Our climate is, is damp and cold in winter. We have actually got a bit of frost today, it's probably the coldest morning we've had for a long time. But it's, it's when it's damp that you feel cold, so you need to be warm. So we've got thermals, bottoms and top. I've then like a, a mid layer or another inner layer there, which I, get, I think is merino wool based. So that's keeping me warm. I have this fibre pile hoodie. Uh, I think it's high gloss. I liked it because it's got a hood. So if you're in the tent at night, and you, you can put the hood up, you can sleep in it as well, and it feels very cosy. Uh, this is my Paramo Cascade jacket. I hate to think when I bought this, it could be 15 years ago, and it, I still use it as my main jacket. The thing I like about it, it's soft, so it doesn't rustle when you walk. There's plenty of pockets. It's waterproof. You do have to keep washing it and proofing it with Nick Wax, uh, the washing one, to keep the water repellency up. But yeah, it is my probably my favourite jacket. Luckily, as I'm retired, I can pick and choose when I want to go camping. So if there's 24 hours of rain forecast, I don't go out. I pick nice weather, but as you'll see from the videos, we all get caught out with the rain, and it wouldn't stop me going out if it was if it was a bit rainy. But I have got this. If it was going to rain, I'd put this on. All I know is it's a Berghaus Gore-Tex windproof waterproof jacket. I'll try and find the name of it and put the description on. But that sort of if I can get it on. That covers everything up. I didn't like the short jackets. I wanted something long and that's why I went for this, for this jacket. And it's got a hood as well. I'll take that off. Because even though it's about 0 degrees, I'm getting a bit hot. So, while we're here, um, we've done the coat. Gloves, you need warm gloves, especially in winter. These are Trek Mates. I will have bought these from Go Outdoors. They are a Gore-Tex glove. And somewhere in one of these pockets, I've just some thin, thin thermal gloves. So, I might put those on when I'm in the tent if I was if I was really cold, uh, or if it was snow down and really cold, those would go on, and then the over mitts on top. So that's an, and a hat. Definitely need a hat. Um, I have various ones, uh, basically black. Um, but yeah, you need a hat because that's where you're going to lose your heat. Sometimes I've got a buff, and I'll put that around my neck. So it's just an added bit of insulation if it's really cold. Looking lower down. Now for years, I just wore normal, like crag hoppers, that type of uh, poly cotton trousers. Uh, and I took over trousers with me. But I never wore the over trousers. I hated wearing them. They were noisy things. They scuffed as you walked. And most of the time, I carried them around with me. I walked through some heather, got my trousers wet, I just couldn't be bothered to put the over trousers on. So it was only last year, I thought, I got these, these are Paramo, I think these are Paramo, I think they're called Cascade uh, trousers again, same name as the jacket. Uh, they're made of the same material, they're nice and soft, but they're waterproof. So I just wear these in, uh, in the wet and the winter months. Uh, they are warm, you walk through the heather and the water just seems to brush off. So yeah, these were a great improvement and I don't have to carry another pair of over trousers now. So that is my trousers, yeah, uh, Paramo Cascade. 
uh, gaiters. You need those for where, for where in the Peak District. You get footpaths, but a lot of the time you're cutting across where the heather is. And it's continuously muddy and boggy. So apart from getting wet, it, it, you just got to wear gaiters. It, uh, it protects the bottom of your trousers, adds a bit of warmth. Um, quite often, you'll just put your foot on what looks like a, a little bit of a peaty ground. And I tell you, you'll go down to your knee uh, in sticky black peaty mud. Lovely it is. Lovely. That's what Kinder Scout's about. So yeah, so I've got uh, gaiters on. And then my boots. There's, these are like a winter boot. I think you can see them. They're Scarpa Manta Pros. I tend to wear them in winter. The, the waterproof, Gore-Tex and waterproof. They are quite a rigid boot. So you could put crampons on. I haven't got any crampons. If we suddenly got severe winters, I would go out immediately and buy some, and I know I can fit them to these boots. But it was mainly I wanted some uh, hard wearing and waterproof, and, and a bit rigid, because a lot of the times, if you're, if you're up on Kinder and going up and down the gruffs, you need to kick holes into the side of the peak gruff so you can climb up the other side. Uh, the other boots I've got, which if it were mild I would wear them, are Mean Deal, if I pronounce that right, Mean Deal, Butan, M, MFS or something. I did used to have, um, oh I can't remember, they were a Mean Deal Burma Pro. They wore out and the only ones I could get were the Butan to replace those. So that basically I think covers all my gear. I've got two pairs of walking socks on, a very thin pair and a thick pair to sort of reduce the effect of blisters. But I must admit, one, the boots I wear, I have not had any blisters for years. The other thing is, I don't walk as far as I used to. Uh, wild camping for me is more the camping side of it. And you'll have noticed a lot of my wild camps are on the, the hills above Sheffield. So I might only walk probably about the most, probably about five miles or something like that. Obviously, if I go up on Kinder and Bleeko, you are walking bigger distances. But I've not had any trouble with blisters uh, for, for many years. So that sort of covers the gear I, I wear. And like I say, if you bought this lot new, you could be getting on to a thousand pounds. Biggest expense are probably your boots and, and the jacket. Now I'll tell you a little thing about the boots. The last two pairs, and this will work for all your types of gear. Those boots, I think they were at Go Outdoors uh, for 250, which is quite a lot. But Go Outdoors have a scheme where if you can find it cheaper online, they will match the price and not 10% off and you're guaranteed to find them cheaper so I think I looked on online immediately and I found these for about I think they're about 210 so I just went look you can get them there 210 pound they said that's fine sir so they they gave them me for 210 part of the deal they knocked 10% off so they knocked 21 quid off so I got them for about 190. So for all gear, that's how Go Outdoors work. And quite often I've had some real bargains off them. Worth knowing. Right, so that covers my gear. I'm not, uh, me, me clothing, should I say. I'm now gonna set a sheet up and uh, we'll start having a look at the camping gear. I had to move around, the sun is chasing me around and filming when the sun is on you in always easy. So we're going to go through and look at the camping gear I carry in my rucksack. So first of all, the rucksack. Um, it's a light wave, wild trek, 70 litre. 
I bought this basically because I wanted one pack that just had one single compartment, I could cram all my gear in and I'm walking up to a campsite, unloading it, camping and walking back. I have got a another pack with all the pockets on. This suited me for winter camping. It'll carry up to about 18 kilos. I carry about, well it's 20, I'm, I'm crossed between pounds and kilos. This weighs 25 pounds, which I think is about 11 kilos. So there's a, I can carry a lot more in it. Uh, if I take me over and a few other bits, yeah, the weight does creep up. But this, um, yeah, it's 70 litres and it, it serves its purpose perfectly. It, another thing attracted me was uh, it was lightweight. It was only about 1.5 kilograms. You have to think, I probably bought this seven years ago. So things might have moved on from there. So, so I'm not going to set this up, but this is the first thing I set up and it's my tent and you'll have seen it so many times uh, and so many people have got them and what a fantastic tent. It's a Hilleberg Sulu. It's not the lightest, but it is so strong and so secure, and that's what you want for winter camping. So we've got the, the Sulu tent, and I've got a footprint attached to it. I don't want any little holes in my ground sheet. If you saw me bleed cloak camp in a couple of inches of water, you can understand why. So that's the Sulu tent three poles now pegs I made these myself with my sewing machine I have assortment of pegs these are out kit I think long beams or something they're probably about nine inches 175 mil long I've got some skewers there you want long pegs if you're camping in the peak district you usually get your heather then sort of soft undergrowth and then the peat by the time if you put like a four inch peg in it isn't going to hold you want something long that's going to penetrate the loose stuff and get into some solid ground I've also got these delta pegs, if I've got that right. Delta ground anchors. I usually take a couple of those and put those on the, the main guy lines that's supporting the tent where the wind's coming in. They are really secure anchors. They are a bit bulky, but um, at least you feel secure when you've got a couple of those in. So that's uh, the tent set up. We might as well look at stuff as it comes out. So for my sleeper system, I can show you that. So I've always used the same system. That is a, a windscreen protector. But for me, it's a bit like an insulated sheet I can put down. Just give myself a bit more room. It's, uh, it probably has a, a little bit of effect keeping you warm, but it's more for a bit of protection.
So this is the mattress I use. It's a X bed down mat 7M, whether that means medium. I think the 7 is the thickness of it. Now before, I used to blow it up me doing like heart compressions. I'm not going to pump it all up, but I bought this, it's called a snozzle bag. So it's just a matter of <laughs> getting that full of air and then you can push the air straight into the, the mattress. I can see I'm not going to pump it all up for the, just for the video. So that's the mattress. So once you've got that pumped up, you've got a nice warm uh, base to insulate you from the ground. And that is what you're after. That's where you're going to get cold if you're not insulated from the ground. Sleeping bag now. This is, oh, I'll show you the bag. But I only got this, I think, earlier this year. It's uh, an event waterproof. Uh, oh, sorry. It's... See to summit, it's like a compression sack and stuff sack all in one. I found with the winter sleeping bag, it was so bulky. So I bought the, this uh, compression sack and it gets this bag down. I'd even thought about buying a new bag, but it was so expensive. And what, what I was after was more compressibility. And I think this compression site cost me about 20 quid, but it really reduced the size of my sleeping bag. So I'll just whip this out. So yeah, I will, like I say, I'll list everything in the description. But that is, that, that really changed it for me. Rather than buy a new sleeping bag to get a smaller pack size, I bought this, and you can get all different sizes. This is probably a little, it's probably about 150 grams. I know you can buy a lighter version, but they had sold out when I was looking. So yeah, that's the compression stuff sack. So this is my sleeping bag, it is probably about 15 years old. It's my winter bag, so I'm not going to use it that many times. It's a Rab Ladaka, if I've pronounced that right. It's a, um, a Rab Down bag. There's quality, just be the, the name isn't the Rab in sleeping bags. But I find that it's very warm. Um, I forget the weight, it is reasonably heavy, it could be, I don't know if it's about 1700 grams, I'll put it in the description, I can't remember, you can probably get lighter ones nowadays, but it's a cost, to buy that equivalent now, could be about three or 400 pounds, so I thought, for the amount of winter camps I'll do, this will uh, serve me over the next few years, so We'll move that to one side. Uh, see what else we've got. Aha! My favourite bit of kit. Now that keeps you reasonably warm. But when it's really cold, my feet suffer. So, some people might laugh at this. That is a hot water bottle. That was a game changer. If you can boil up a couple of litres of water, you put it in there, it turns what could be a bit of a cool camp into pure luxury. I, I would never have gone to winter camp without that. It might be that just my feet get cold, but once you've got your feet on that, you feel fantastic. So, so simple and so cheap, hot water bottle.
other two bits of sleep kit. That's a simple pillar. Out well, don't really mean much. Um, I got that from Go Outdoors. I wanted a decent sized pillar. You can get lighter. A lot of people will say, well, just push some clothing in a stuff sack. Well, you do that. I do not like that at all. It's uncomfortable. That's a little inflatable pillar and it just feels fantastic. It uh, just supports your neck and it really improves my night's sleep. And two bits more items of uh, luxury. I know it's supposed to be lightweight camping, but you're in, you could be in the tent for 12 to 14 hours in winter. You want to be warm and comfortable. So a while ago, I got these. These are, if I find the name, I can, Oh, I'll have to list it in. I think it's, uh, it's Exped. Yeah, these are made by Exped. The down booties. So, yeah, it's got it there, Exped. That's made of a uh, goose down. So you've got a nice down booty to keep your foot warm. You can wear those in the sleeping bag. And then you've got these waterproof liners that go over the boot. Give a bit more insulation, a bit more warmth. But because that's waterproof, you can go out the tent. So if you want to go out the tent to go to the toilet perhaps, or to um, do a bit of photography, you don't have to put your walking boots on. You, or to, say, do your guy ropes and that. You can put these on. And as you come back in, remove the wet outer, and you've still got the down booty on. And they certainly keep my feet a lot warmer. Uh, again, it could be 10 years ago I got them. Whether they're still available, I'm not sure. We won't go too far into that. I think that's quite obvious what that is. Uh, you don't want to be getting out of the tent and your sleeping bag in the middle of the night to go to the toilet when you've got a simple plastic bottle. So, water now, water filters. Water weighs a lot. You do not want to carry that. So you, you want a water filter. Now for many years, I used a Soya mini filter. And you probably saw previous videos, it was taking me ages to fill bottles up. So, through a few people on YouTube doing recommendations, I bought this. I've only used it once, I think. Put it the right way. It's a Catadyne Be Free water filter. You've like a little rubber bag, um, not rubber, but it feels rubbery and you filter on the end. But it is so quick, it really um, filters the water quick. What I tend to do, just personal preference, this is an Autoli, Auti, can't pronounce it, Autolib uh, 4 litre water bag. So I'll fill that up at the, the river or stream and carry that to camp with me. And then, once I'm in camp, I use my filter, and I can fill these two, uh, the soda water bottles. I think they're stronger than just a, a normal bottle. So I use two of them. And they'll also fit in my boots in the tent. So that, that is uh, the water filter, um, the water system. So, we're getting to the cooking system now. 
For winter, you'll find, and it's cold, gas does not work so good. Even with propane in, it doesn't work efficiently. So I use a liquid fuel stove. The one I've had for many years is a, a whisper light. That's your pump. That goes into your fuel can uh, that has Coleman fuel in. And then your stove goes on the end there. You can pump that up. It's been 100% reliable. It comes with a service kit if there was any problems. It burns really hot and you can you need a lot of heat in winter because the water is probably not degrees so you've got to raise that to boiling so for me winter it's a liquid fuel stove now not that you just get some of this lot out not that I, I quite often take another little stove That's a pocket rocket, MSR pocket rocket, a little gas cylinder stove. It doesn't weigh much. And I can set that up in, up, up in the porch inside the tent, basically. The door's open, but if I want to make a drink in the middle of the night, it's easier to use the little gas stove than firing up the, the whisper light. Uh, cooking now. Winter, you want some nice, warm, substantial food. If you like dehydrated meals, you eat dehydrated meals. I would rather have a ribeye steak, bit of pasta, and a nice sauce, something like that. Frying pan will cook all that. And in the morning, what beats a full English breakfast? So that is my chosen cooking pan for winter. I've got this Titan uh, kettle, can use that for boiling your pasta or boiling your water for your cups of tea, cups of coffee. If I've got the um, whisper light set up I'll have that outside the tent and I've got a windshield there, makes the stove a lot more efficient. And then uh, for drinks, simple insulated mug to keep your drink a lot warmer in winter. Right, so that would be coffee, powdered milk and sugar. That covers my drinks. They're little Nalgene bottles. I tend to use those. I think they're top quality. Washing up, we've all got to do it at some stage. Bit of washing up liquid and a bit of a scourer. That, that's all I take. That's washing up for, for the pots and pans. Washing up for me, I don't bother taking anything. I'm out for the night, back the next day. I ain't having a wash, no way. That's uh, general bits of pieces. There's lighters, a flint, knife, fork, spoon, a bit of a support for the um, air gas stove to make it a bit more stable in the tent. First aid kit, that gets smaller and smaller. I very rarely ever use anything. It's got a few tablets in, uh, some elastoplast and... Uh, Ear, ear defenders and there's a whistle in there so uh, very, very limited what I actually take rubbish bags we are going to create a bit of rubbish um, that's for toilet facility as you know you're basically going to bury your waste and you bring your toilet paper out that does not degrade that well so your toilet paper and all your cooking waste goes in those bin liners sealed up 
and you bring that all out and take it home. So the last few bits, you can see the sun's come out now. I've been, that's why I moved over here, because the sun was coming round, and filming with the sun ain't always so good. Um, especially, you've got... So I've nearly covered everything. As you can see, I've got the sun in my face now. It's just come round the corner of the building. I wanted to try and film film without the sun coming out because it, it's not so good because you've got a, a bright part and a, a shadowy part but we've not got too much more to go through so other important thing you're camping in winter you're going to be dark for probably I don't know 14 hours and you're going to be in the tent for 14 hours So for lighting, that's a Petzl headlamp. That's my main form of lighting. And one of the other things I use it for, I fasten it around the tripod and then I can shine it on me and film talking to you from in the tent. I like having a chat to you in the tent. So that's my headlamp. Um, I've got this little button cell. I tend to hang that round my neck so that you've always got light. You might suddenly wake up and what, where's the, the stove? You can flick that on, you know you've got it and there's, a, there's light available rather than looking for your headlamp in the dark. Now, I recently got these two, well, that one I've had for many years and I bought this a couple of months ago. I can't pronounce this. Kogolans. I will write it in the description. They're just little LED lanterns. They weigh very few grams, and I tend to hang a couple of those in the tent. Uh, they'll last, that'll last about 18 hours or something like that. That's not so long, but it'll last probably eight hours. And that will give you some just dim lighting in the tent, and they can stay on all the time. So that is me lighting. Uh, we've got a little little knife there. Kuderman. It's good for opening packets. Um, yeah, you need a knife. It's uh, it's fully legal because the blade. I think it's got to be less than two and three quarter inches or something like that. So it's legal to carry about with you. Yeah. And, uh, where is it? Mobile phone, you need that because you can call for help with that, apart from looking at the internet if you've got 4G and all that side of it, checking the weather forecast. So, yeah, you want to, I think everybody's got a mobile phone. A little FM radio, quite often. There isn't any 4G up on Kinder, and you can't look at anything. So I take a little FM radio. It's very small. It's called Prunus, that's the name of it. I did have another one, but I broke the aerial off. So that is exactly the same radio, but a different make. And again, I'll put that in the description. The radio, it just... It, you're in the tent a long time you need something, a bit of music to listen to now because we've got 
a mobile phone, we've got um, camera equipment, we've got rechargeable torches. He's now made this take even more weight. So that's a, a power bank, a little battery pack. I take that with me, it'll probably give me phone a couple of charges, something like that. But I did feel, be taking that, I've got to take this and it's extra weight. Modern, modern lifestyle. Coming out to the important bits now. As you'll have seen from the last couple of videos, my titanium whiskey flask. 260 mil. It's about 10 whiskies that. Might have to get a, a bigger one, I think. But yeah, so that's my titanium whiskey flask. And I'm not really going to drink from the flask. Why ruin the drinking experience when you can have your own Glencairn whiskey glass? All right, it weighs a bit. But this is for enjoyment, this camp. It's not super lightweight. So that's my, my whiskey glass. And I think... I have covered everything there. So, yep, I think we've covered all my gear. Like you say, a lot of this gear is, is quite old and to buy it today is going to cost a lot of money. The biggest is the Sulu tent. I think I looked the other day and it was, it was over £800. Whether I would pay £800 for a tent, I don't think I would. I probably bought that six years ago, and I'm sure it was nearer the 400 mark. Like anything, you can shop around. Just because one person sells it at that, look on the internet. I know some people aren't too familiar and a bit worried about using the internet, but that's where you're going to get your cheaper prices. And if you can pr find somewhere that will price match, like go outdoors, it's another way of buying stuff. I think these, again, I searched all over. They came from um, a place in Germany. Uh, forgot the name of it. So many different uh, outdoor gear companies. The, the frustrating thing is, I think I got large, and when they came, they were too big. So that is the risk with buying online. So I had to go through the process of sending them back to Germany, and I think these are either, I think they're medium, something like that. So there, there is that element of risk when you're buying stuff online. But sleep, it's like a sleeping bag. You really want to get inside it and try it before you buy it to make sure it's the right length and the right width and that. So yeah, you want to try it, but if you buy online, you, you will get it cheaper. Both of these are titanium. I got these on AliExpress. Again, that's uh, China. China. I know it's a long way away. But all you do is click a button, you've got to wait. Three weeks later, my flask turns up. I think I paid 25 for that. If I'd have bought it in the UK, it would have been 40 or 50 pounds. I didn't mind the month wait. So yeah, there is a way of getting gear cheaper. But it, it did really take me back when I saw today's prices. But you can buy second hand I would think if you're starting out, buy some second hand gear and get used to it and then we're all individual. You tune your gear to how you, you, you feel you want to be in that and what suits you. Um, this is just my choice. Everybody's going to have uh, different ideas. Uh, people might look at this and think, well, what are you carrying all that extra gear for? Like my booties, my whiskey, my radio. I like, the, I like the camping experience and I like to be comfortable. And in, it, to me, it's more enjoyable if I'm comfortable. I'm not into really lightweight, saving the grams. To me, I don't feel as comfy at night and, and things like that. And... The, cook, the frying pan in exactly lightweight, but I like cooking. 
and that's part of a wild camp for me is the cooking side of things so I don't mind carrying the extra weight uh, for, for, the, for that side of it so we can say we, we've covered all, all the camping gear when you come back from a wild camp your gear is going to most likely be wet perhaps a bit dirty so what I'm going to go through now is how I look after my gear when I return from a wild camp so we're just going to pop up to the greenhouse now uh, it's a bit of video I did from the last camp so uh, you'll notice a change of clothing so this is where I initially dry any wet gear when I've been out uh, while camping. This is actually my field and trek trail maker tent. I used it on the ringing load camp where we did the roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. It wasn't too bad, it wasn't that wet, but sometimes you pack up in the morning and it is soaking. So it gets hung in here for a couple of days basically to drip dry. I'll just show you the the hooks I use for hanging stuff from the the top of the greenhouse. So you can see the type of hook I use. It's like a, an S bend, and it just hooks through. Then you can you can hang your your tent on it like that. Of uh, of another one there. That's very similar, just a bit more lightweight. Uh, I just got these on. Um, on eBay, they weren't expensive at all, probably a, a couple of quid for half a dozen. But uh, I've got them scattered all over here so I can hang all sorts of wet gear up. I also, like I say, stuff like gaiters and ground sheets. Uh, anything that's really wet gets hung in here for a couple of days. My tent pegs, I give them a good scrub just with a brush to get the dirt off, a bit of water, and then they just go on the floor and they, they soon dry off. So this is where I initially dry stuff. Uh, I'll take you down to the garage. Um, I have another area there where I, I dry stuff like my rucksack and I also give the tent another bit of a dry it's indoors just to make sure it's thoroughly dry so we'll, we'll just pop down to the garage so we're in the the garage now where i keep most of my gear i've got these two cupboards here and this is where i store a lot of my clothing uh, quite a lot of my camping gear, not not the expensive tents and uh, sleeping bags they're kept inside the house but uh, quite a lot of gear is kept here I've got a cupboard up there, it's got to be dehydrator a lot of cooking gear and stuff like that but this, this is the area where I dry my clothing you can probably just see there I've got a uh, I think it's about a 500 watt oil filled radiator just wired up to a, a switch here so when I come in from a, a wild camp I can switch that on hang me my wet clothing like my paramo jacket trousers my waterproof coat rucksacks usually a bit damp so all that gear gets hung up over the radiator it's only a gentle heat, it's only 500 watts, so it ain't going to cost much and it's not going to damage anything, it's just a, a gentle drying heat. My tent, like I say, is up in the greenhouse, getting rid of the, uh, the, the, the surplus water, probably dripping more than anything. So that, that gear is left there for a couple of days to ensure it's, it's bone dry. Now. Even though my tent has been hung up in the greenhouse for a couple of days, it feels dry, but just to be sure, what I tend to do
I tend to hang the tent up over the radiator. It's, uh, I might leave it for a couple of days. You want to be sure that any moisture in your seams has gone away and that is bone dry and especially like guy ropes especially on the outer they take quite a bit of drying and you, you want it to be bone dry before you pack it away although you'll, pro you'll probably get mildew or it'll smell and it ain't gonna last 35 year old tent still going strong because I've looked after it so that'll probably have a probably a day there and then I'll bring the outer down do the same with that and then I know my gear is bone dry it can be packed away in the stuff sacks ready for the next camp so that's basically how I look after my wet gear after a while camp so we'll we'll go back to the uh, the video now so back up at the the summer house now now I might add as well that all my gear like sleeping bag, uh, down booties, my mattress, anything like that, I drape that over the chairs in the house wherever I can get it uh, and leave it there for two or three days, uh, especially sleeping bag to again ensure everything's perfectly dry and then it can be packed away ready for the next camp. So I thought I'd just briefly show you the camera gear I use now. Now for up to about 18 months, two years ago, I just used a Sony A37 DSLR, big shotgun microphone on top, and that's uh, interchangeable lenses. That is what I used, it weighed probably about a kilogram with a standard lens and all the batteries etc. And I was always after ways of reducing the weight. So I think the first little camera I bought, oh, this one, was this little Sony RX100. Uh, it gave me great footage and I use it for, I still use it now. One thing I like about it, it's great in low light conditions. This is the, the basic model, probably cost about 250. Again, I was looking on the computer, I think you can get a Mark 7 version now, and it, it might be 900 quid, it was ridiculous. Anyway, this was about 250, it's a little bit battered, it's blown over on the tripod a few times. But I use that, our main use for that now is low light conditions. So when I'm cooking in the tent and the light has gone dark, I use it. Or if I'm talking in the tent, I use it then. Uh, I've got about three or four spare batteries. And I tend to pack everything away in these Ziploc bags. Uh, you'll probably notice quite a bit of my gear was in those. I'd rather use them than stuff sacks. You can see what's in them. So that was one camera I use. And then the other one, which uh, I think a lot of us use now, are GoPros. Uh, I was probably many years behind before I got this. This is a GoPro Hero 5, I think. And it's so small and light. And the footage is astounding. I know, again, these have moved on. But that, that, I do most of my filming with that now because of the lightweight and the fantastic footage. The only thing against it is it doesn't seem to do well in low light and the wind noise. So, to get around that, this is how I work. When I'm filming my YouTube videos now, if I'm using that and there's any little breeze or a bit of wind, I've got a, a Sony audio recorder and a little lapel mic in here. I'll just get it out. Little lapel mic. That goes on there. That's in my pocket. I record the audio on that. I film the video on that. And... 
if there's any wind noise on the editor, which I will show you on another video, I sort of sync that audio against this footage and you get perfect audio and perfect footage. It, uh, it takes a bit of messing about doing. Um, my video editor was to do it automatically, but it doesn't. So I have to move the audio up and down. But I will show you that in a later video. So that is basically my uh, my camera gear. I've replaced my DSLR with, with two cameras. I like the two cameras because I could have that running. I might want to do a close-up of uh, my breakfast. So I can then use that one. And I have quite often hear people say... I can't do the video because something's gone faulty, the SD cards, something's gone wrong with that. So I don't like to have all my eggs in one basket. So I take these two little cameras with me and they weigh less than the uh, DLSR on its own. And the only other bit of, uh, if I could describe it as camera gear, I might take with me is this little item DJI Mavic Air drone that provides some fantastic footage unbelievable so I think we can say that brings to an end sort of rev a review of my winter wild camping gear at the end of the day you want to be warm dry and comfortable some nice food to eat, something nice to drink, and it, is, it all makes uh, an enjoyable and memorable camp. I have, uh, think the next video will be from the garden as well. Hopefully we'll be out of lockdown in December, but I have got a couple of videos I want to do uh, from the pub shed um, covering one is how I make a video and the other is just a, a look at the pub shed and an excuse for a drink it is Christmas so if I could thank you for watching and I'll, I'll see you on the next video soon bye then